Hey guys, welcome to a news dump in space. Or wherever we want it to be. Yeah, it's actually a green screen. It's at my time. house. Yeah, we're filming something else later after this, so uh, yeah. You're gonna wanna see it. Mm -hmm. Now we've talked far too positively about AMC theaters in the wake of this whole MoviePass fiasco. It was for a good enough reason. MoviePass succeeded in changing the way people see movies by publicly sacrificing themselves so that others might change. Like a Jesus Christ-like figure. They're the second coming. Mm -hmm. AMC introduced A-List, and it works just fine. Although with MoviePass dying, it's really anyone's guess as to whether or not AMC will alter the deal. Now, we've said MoviePass a few times right now in this video so that you could just watch it and the SEO will be great. So let's talk about how it wouldn't be weird for AMC theaters to alter the deal because they're a gigantic business and gigantic businesses tend to be dicks in favor of profitability. Yeah, that's pretty much standard for any big business though, but let's talk about the specifics of why AMC Theaters is still evil after all that decent press recently. And it's because they essentially strong arm small independent theater chains, causing them to go out of business. It's a tale as old as time. Now, if I guess if your version of time only exists from the 1960s to now. Yeah. Although the railroad companies, <laughs> And yeah. the old car, I mean, it, it, big more prominent now. Yeah. Big businesses, they come into towns, they set up shop, they promise a monorail, <laughs> they offer up everything at sometimes cheaper prices or just make things more convenient. And then boom, mom and pop shops are gone and mom and pop are dead. This story with AMC though is a bit different though because the word conspiracy is thrown around in it. We all know y'all love a good conspiracy. The internet's been uh, pretty quiet on the conspiracy front lately. Oh yeah, I wonder why. Hmm. Now anyways, you see, in uh, Houston, Texas, there was a small theater named Viva Cinemas Theater, which ran movies either dubbed or subbed in Spanish. Oh, we can get into the whole subs versus dubs debate later, although I don't think it has any effect here. They happily occupied a specific niche within, within their community until, according to The Hollywood Reporter, by way of a lawsuit filed by Viva Cinemas, AMC Theaters allegedly decided to, allegedly, Screw this and any other local theater over by conspiring with the big movie studios to gain exclusivity on first-run films in its geographical region. Because the small theater couldn't get first-run films, which actually bring out the crowds, they went out of business. Sad. Usually this would just be brushed off or settled, but the federal judge in Texas is apparently letting this thing move forward to a jury trial in which Viva could win if they can prove that AMC literally conspired with major movie studios in order to dominate over the smaller Spanish-speaking competition in this area. According to The Hollywood Reporter, this would be the first jury trial examining the relationship between movie theaters and film studios since a 1948 case, the United States versus Paramount Pictures which resulted in what's known as the Paramount Consent Decree. Basically means that studios can't own movie chains. Yeah, because then they would just run all of their own movies in those chains and it would be, yeah. it's, a, it's an antitrust thing. That's how it used to be in like the 20s, you'd have to go to like, yeah, the Paramount, the Paramount Theater, Paramount theater. Yeah. you'd have to go to the Columbia Theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this new, this new case here, it has some parallels to that. But what's more interesting is that just this year, the U.S. Justice Department started reviewing the Paramount Consent Decrees because, I don't know, for some reason, every law that's been put into place over the past 100 years or so needs to be undone. We got too much dang regulation out here. <laughs> uh, anyway. I say we bring back asbestos. Uh, <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? Yeah, especially if your face is printed on it. But, uh, yeah, it should be interesting to see how this plays out and what effect it has on the future here, especially when they're reviewing these kinds of laws. Anyways, let's move into more mind-boggling bullshit from the entertainment industry because this story is crazy and, and it's only made crazier by the fact that updates not only happened while we were writing this script, but by the time this airs, more things could have changed. <laughs> let's start from the beginning here. Great impersonation. You would fit right in with this Hey story. guys, this is Michael Jackson with a new track. Oh my God, Michael Jackson's back from the dead. Mm -hmm. That's right, it's me, Michael Jackson. <laughs> you sure you're not Mickey Mouse? No, Michael Jackson. Well, yeah, let's start from the beginning here. In 2014, someone filed a class action lawsuit saying that Sony Music had used a vocalist who sounds like Michael Jackson, but most certainly is not Michael Jackson, he's dead, for songs on the posthumous album, Michael, back in 2010. According to the lawsuit, these fake songs, breaking news, fake monster, songs. fake songs. The songs are breaking news, monster, and keep your head up. They were actually sung by someone named Jason Malachi. Malachi Love Robinson? I don't know what the name Malachi means with things being fake, but it is strange. I love this because this is a conspiracy. And if you had told me this, like if, if, if this person with this lawsuit had been like, yeah, actually they hired an actor to impersonate, I'd be like, shut up, you're crazy. This is nuts. But yeah, so whatever. It is funny that the name Malachi and people who are 
fake liars. Mm -hmm. Just goes together well. Anyway, earlier this past week, it was widely reported that during the court hearing for this lawsuit, Sony had actually admitted that yes, sure, we did hire a Michael Jackson impersonator to record these songs so we could profit off of completely fake new or found tracks that weren't actually performed by the King of Pop. That was the initial story. Yeah. But turns out that all of the articles that flew right onto the internets, they were the result of some bad information from people in the courtroom who took a quote that was uttered by a lawyer representing Sony and Jackson's estate as gospel instead of wild speculation. The quote was essentially, even if the vocals weren't Jackson's, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Check. Check me. Ex extra, extra. Uh, so, well, yeah, Sony Music has come out against these claims as of the time of this writing, and the lawyer in question, Zia Modaver, released a statement which read, No one has conceded that Michael Jackson did not sing on the songs. The hearing Tuesday was about whether the First Amendment protects Sony Music and the estate, and there has been no ruling on the issue of whose voice is on the recordings. But hey, since this thing's not settled yet, we get to keep wondering about the final result for a little while longer. Was it actually Michael Jackson singing on these songs or merely an imposter brought in by an evil company to trick the fans into spending more money so that Sony could still profit off of their deceased pop star? The world may never know. Or we will when the lawsuit's finished, whichever comes first. End of the world, Either end way, of the lawsuit. It's wild that this is even a discussion that's taking place in a court of law. These fans need their refunds if this is not the actual Michael Jackson. Yeah, they do. It's true. I agree. And, but, and Jackson's estate. I, I, I could see them being upset about this. Mm -hmm. What about Janet? What, oh. about, uh, what about Tito? Yeah. Yeah. But hey, let's, uh, let's break up this bad dun -dun, and boring lawsuit news with the story of Paul Flart, a humble thoughtful man who took a job as a security guard at a Florida hospital in order to be closer to his aging mother after his father passed away. And he turned that situation into a viral sensation out of what we can only imagine was extreme boredom. Yeah. Now, Paul Flart, not his real name, obviously, he started an Instagram account where every single post was just him at work in full uniform, ripping some of the best farts we've ever heard. Yeah, it was like music to my ears. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. That's the whole, just the whole a, thing. Just a man with a mustache farting for posts that are only a few seconds long each. Yeah. But each day, a new fart. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do this time? I wonder what the fart's gonna sound like. What do you oh, have man. for dinner? Oh man. He should have put what he had for dinner in the comments yeah. of the videos. But anyways, the internet loves that weird shit though. It's basically art on the internet. It is. So obviously his Instagram started gathering up quite the epic following of people after it was apparently featured on YouTube compilations and featured on the Barstool Sports website. His fans would look forward to his work farts as a way to probably break up their own boring lives or bask in a few seconds of joy far away from the actual smell of Paul Flart's gas. That's a good point. Like being in a room with someone that lets out huge farts, not, not fun, but just hearing them from a safe distance over the internet, everyone wins. And there's tons of weird smells in hospitals. You wouldn't be able to identify yes. that this was Paul Flart's fart. That's true. Mm -hmm. It was the perfect non-crime crime. Sadly though, the hospital he worked at didn't find his new viral fame or his farts all that funny. They don't have a sense of humor. God. And this week, Paul Flart was fired from his security guard position. And by the way, he live streamed the entire firing. Good. Which probably made the, the man firing him very nervous. Probably he, thought he's, he's gonna fart at any second now. Hey, I know, I just gotta do this, I gotta let you go. You know, you, you have to understand why I gotta do this, but can you give me one for the road? <laughs> hey, Matt, I love the farts, it's yeah. not me. It's the guys upstairs. I printed out uh, uh, an artist rendition of what a nasty fart looks like. Can you sign it for me, please? Maybe he did. Anyways, will he be able to float on his flatulence alone and turn his farts into a stable career where he won't need to rip ass on someone else's clock? Only time will tell. He has set up a Patreon. I think they should let him direct Guardians of the Galaxy 3. It's I think that's fair. a great idea. Yeah. Or the new Bond movie. Because that's what we're talking about next. <sighs> yeah, here's some actual movie news before we get into trailers. Uh, yeah, the next Bond film, which has already had a ton of issues leading up to this point, they got Danny Boyle as their director, yay, and now they've lost Danny Boyle as their director. Did he tweet about young boys? Mm, no. Oh. He just, I guess he doesn't want to do it. The, the newest Bond is really shaping up to be a fucking mess, considering the fact that the current James Bond, Daniel Craig, has previously stated, before production even started, that he would rather die than do another Bond film. 
Uh, contracts are contracts, though, so we basically had to either way. And with Danny Boyle in the director's chair, hey guys, it seems like this might be a good addition to a franchise that, in our opinions, hasn't been too exciting recently. No, I liked Casino Royale, but that was that was a, a generation ago at this point. Skyfall was pretty decent, it had a good villain. Spectre, uh, Spectre was... Ooh. Fucking boring well, as hell. Some very pretty shots, but mm, yeah, didn't really hit it for me. Anyway, it seems like Bond was finally hitting its stride, but that all changed this week when it was announced that Danny Boyle would be leaving Bond 25 due to creative differences. Now, what those creative differences are is anyone's guess, but he wasn't officially attached to the project for very long, and you know they don't start filming until December, so. I guess they have a little bit of runway to find something new. And it's gonna be Edgar Wright who comes in. That He's actually on a short list. There was some uh, That articles. would be interesting. It would be very interesting, but then they would just take him off halfway through, keep all the good stuff that Wait. he did. Whoa, whoa, you're trying to do all this like interesting, fun stuff with the Bond franchise. This is, you're supposed to treat- This is very serious. Yeah. You should get James Gunn to direct it. It's a very serious movie about a man whose car shoots rockets. Yes. Please, treat Please. it with the respect it deserves. Well, let's move to trailers, and first up in trailers, a new one for Suspiria, a remake of a classic horror film that looks like it might actually end up being far better than its source material. The original Suspiria hasn't exactly aged well, but it's a cult classic, and its plot about a European dance academy with a lot of dark supernatural secrets looks like it will really benefit from a modern treatment, which is thankfully more along the lines of A24 movies than Blumhouse movies. Although Blumhouse is such a wide net to cast, they, they do have they've a lot had of good ones. I don't want, it, but in general, in general, it's just chum. Oh, uh, by the way, the soundtrack is by Tom York of all people, who actually seems like a perfect fit for the creepy vibe they're going for here. He probably got pretty jealous about uh, his bandmate getting all the good work. Johnny, how do you keep getting these movie soundtracks? That's not how he sounds at all, but no. you know. Uh, it's also a good sign that this is probably going to be really good. Uh, a guy like Tom York doesn't just sign on to any old movie to make his first entire movie soundtrack, so he's got to like something about it. Mm -hmm. Suspiria comes out on November 2nd, just in time for Hollow. Just... Just after... I don't know why just they do this. I don't know why they do your this. Candy. I don't know why they do this. Well, so... November 2nd, I'm assuming that's a Friday. I guess Halloween's in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the weekend before Halloween, I think, is already just like way yeah, too it's probably full. Stacked. They got an actual yeah. Halloween coming out in the weeks yeah. before. And it makes sense. It's just always like, uh, God damn it. Yeah. Anyway, a few weeks back, we saw a trailer for King of Thieves, a British film about a bunch of old guys doing a heist that's based on a true story. And this week, we've got The Old Man and the Gun, an American film based on a true story about an old man who robs banks. Yeah. This old man, though, is Robert Redford, and this is officially the last movie he'll ever act so in. So it better be fucking good. Yeah, he started dozens of films going back over a half century, so I guess that's a pretty good vote of confidence, considering he would choose this role as his last one before retirement. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the movie's based on the life of Forrest Tucker, a career criminal who spent his entire life in and out of jail, successfully escaping from prison 12 separate times and continuing to commit robberies well into old age. It also stars uh, Sissy Spacek. That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. Well, she's been absolutely killing it on Hulu's Castle Rock series wow. this season. Uh, so good to see her still out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Old Man of the Gun comes out September 28th. If you want to watch something very jarring, my favorite Rob for Re Robert Redford movie is The Great Gatsby. And if you put that next to the new one, because I just watched the new one recently, and I was just like, this is an abomination. Baz Luhrmann. I I just can't get on board with Baz Luhrmann. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know Joel loves him to death, but I like. What's the uh, Moulin Rouge is yeah. like one of my least favorite movies of all time. I'm serious. It's like, it's that came out so long ago that it's literally a product of its time now. It is. Yeah. Romeo and Juliet was like interesting. Like I that one was cool, but like Moulin Rouge is the most obnoxious fucking thing <laughs> ever made. Uh, moving on though, uh, Jeremy Saulnier the director of Green Room and Blue Ruin, two excellent, extremely violent movies, has a new one coming out on Netflix in September called Hold the Dark, which, unlike his previous movies, looks to be a straight-up horror. It stars Jeffrey Wright, Alexander Skarsgård, and Riley Keough, and the plot centers around a remote town where wolves have been attacking people and have killed a young boy. Jeffrey Wright's character gets hired to hunt down the wolves, but when the dead boy's father, played by Skarsgård, returns home from serving in the Middle East, a bunch of supernatural shit starts happening to make a tense situation even worse. The PTSD has flown from his veins and into the city at large. Mm, wow. So this looks great, or he was the wolf all along and was using his time serving over in the Middle East as a as a cover-up for him being, no. Really makes you think. Uh, yeah, this looks great though. And if you haven't, please go check out Green Room and Blue Ruin. Now, after watching those, it's almost certain 
that you're going to be excited for this and that this one will probably be pretty good. Yeah, although there probably will be some violence in it that makes you go. Really makes you go. There's, there's, there's a part in the green room that I'm just like, holy fucking shit. Yeah. Why did you show me that? Anyway, also in horror, but in more lighthearted and comedic horror, Chance the Rapper is making his screen debut in Slice, which is a movie about a pizza place that happens to be built on top of a gate to hell. Not to be confused with a pizza place that happens to be built on top of a, a pedophile dungeon <laughs> in DC. One, one that had, it, it is uh, magical because there was no basement at that one. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, after multiple pizza delivery boys are slain on the job, Chance and his co-worker, played by Zazie Beats, aka Domino from Deadpool, they try to uncover the truth, and it looks like things get pretty crazy. The rest of the cast here is great. You got Chris Parnell, Paul Shear, Hannibal Buress, and a bunch of other recognizable faces. And even though this does sound kind of like a dumb horror comedy, the fact that it's being released by A24 is a pretty good sign that this is probably also pretty damn good. You guys are just A24 fanboys. But there's a good reason. They've never done me wrong. Mm -hmm. It comes at night with... Anyway, with, with all the extremely dark horror coming out this year, it'll be nice to have something a little more fun. But enough about supernatural horror. How about some real life horror? The Horrors of War. There's a new trailer for the Russian film T-34, apparently based on a true story, about a Russian tank lieutenant in World War II who ends up on basically a suicide mission against a dozen German tanks, manages to survive, gets captured by the Germans and put into a concentration camp, and then later gets put in charge of running a German tank training center because he's just that good at his job. He of course uses this as an opportunity to escape with a stolen tank, I would assume very slowly, and uh, also brings some fellow prisoners. But again, the odds are completely stacked against him because tanks are slow. This honestly looks pretty fucking awesome, and it's refreshing to see a big budget modern look at the Eastern Front, which is significantly more brutal than the Western Front of the war. Uh, what is it, Stalingrad was like one of the worst battles in the entire war? Yeah, and there's a, there's a German movie called Stalingrad that came out in like the 80s. Not to be confused with the Russian Stalingrad that came out like two years ago. The German one is like the most brutal, depressing war movie I've ever seen. Well, it's because it's based on a brutal and depressing Hey guys, battle. let's invade uh, Russia in the dead of winter. Mm -hmm. But what if it's cold? Uh, nah, just, it's fine. Just go read the Wikipedia page of uh, Stalingrad, and that's that's enough horror for one day. Yeah. It's fucking brutal. It's just a bad situation. Uh, anyways, this movie, the Russian tank movie, there's no release date for it yet. It's not even clear if it's going to get a theatrical release. Hopefully it does. If not, I'm sure we'll find it on a Russian torrent site. Mm. Mm. Where you get the best stuff. Yeah. Uh, anyways, that's it for News Dump this week. Check out our other episodes. We have a damn near hour-long episode of Weekly Weird News for you to check out. Uh, we're dying. Yeah. Uh, and also, check out uh, another episode over there. And uh, stay tuned, because the thing we're filming today is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to go up next weekend. And we'll see you guys then. Bye -bye. Well, we'll see you before that. But... Yeah. All right, bye.